Look, my own mother, I, can't, I think it was maybe year five in LA, she said in our language, you know, you know, you know, go just sell the house, come back now. She's like, sell your house in LA, move back to Seattle. You know, at the time, my partner at the time was kind of gave me an ultimatum and was like, either it's me or this acting thing. And listen, in all honesty, like realistically and practically speaking, you can find another partner, whether it be a wife, a husband, whatever it is. Yeah. But you get you've got this one life and you got this one gift that you've been given. You really want to just hang that up and walk away. I had to look out to tell my own mother like, no, mom, trust me. Trust me, I just know in my heart of hearts with all the stuff I've been through. 15 years old, father left, being raised by a single mom, seeing the suffering that she went through. I know there's a lot in this heart. There's a lot inside of here that needs to be expressed artistically. You know, I'm just looking for the right avenues, the right characters to play so that I can come out. Filmmaker Magazine presents Back to One with Peter Rinaldi. Salou Sasse is an actor. He sat down with me on the Upper West Side of Manhattan to talk about the work. Do you have a typical way that you like to begin this process of discovering how to wrap your arms around a new character when you when you're cast in something? Yeah, I do. Um, although sometimes it can vary depending on the time that I have to prep. Um, I did a role, Broken Seats. I played a father. So in playing a dad, playing a nurse, I have a degree in nursing. Mm. Uh, understanding what it means to be a parent. Um, I really was able to just, it's the script. It's The script is the Bible, really, for me. So everything I come up with has to ring true to what the director and what the writer's written on the page. And I start there. I start there and I just dissect that thing and I read it over and over and over and I just make notes, make notes. I find commonalities, I find differences. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of how I begin. Is it you're reading the whole thing or just your <laughs> The parts? whole thing, because yeah. I have to understand what's being said about my character when he's around, yeah. when he's not around, what's being said behind his back, yeah. what's being implied. Um, yeah yeah and once you once you start to get a handle over what this mm -hmm. is that you're going to be or what this overall story is mm -hmm. that this character is is in what do you begin to do to try and get that into your body i begin to look at each scene first the overall what does my character want more than anything for me i feel like everything boils down to power mm. or love Mm. If you don't have money, a lot of times a person can feel powerless mm -hmm. to move forward in a career or in a hope or in a dream. You can have all the money in the world, but if you don't have love, there's still something missing. So to me, it just boils down to those two things, you know, and I look at who am I going to use as a substitution? Mm -hmm. You know, if there's nothing in my immediate life, I go back to, you know, acting from a childlike place and I look at the love that I wish I would have gotten from my dad because my dad left when I was 15. Mm -hmm. And then as far as power, most often I'll use my mother as a substitution. Why? Mm -hmm. Because she had this duality in her. She had to be mom and she had to be dad. So there's mm -hmm. often a power struggle with her and I. Mm -hmm. So she works really good for that substitution. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh I look at the scene. What do I want from this person in this scene? I start looking at the objectives, uh, obstacles, uh, what's preventing me from getting what I want. I look at different beats and actions to where I can, because people are, we're all very, we all can be very manipulative. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so how do I manipulate this other individual? Do I want them to feel sorry for me? Mm -hmm. Do I want them to empathize with me? Do I want to make them, do I want to make them laugh? Mm -hmm. Do I want to be charming? Mm -hmm. So, and it's, it's, it's the inner monologue too is huge for me. Mm -hmm. um, what am I actually trying to say beneath the dialogue? Yeah. And then it's just going and making sure that it resonates with me. Mm -hmm. If it doesn't move me, I, I can't, I can't think that it's going to move an audience. Mm -hmm. 
So if I'm reading dialogue and it's moving me, I remember I had a scene in this show and it's a scene where my son helps me out of bed. We're getting ready to go to dinner. My character has Lou Gehrig's disease. So I'm sick, he helps me up. He sits me in my wheelchair and I'm like, hey, sit down, let me talk to you. And I have to tell him that when I leave, I'm gonna need him to be the man of the house. I'm telling him, I'm gonna need you to start being the man of the house. And he's a young kid and he's like, dad, how do I, how do I become the man of the house? And I have to explain that to him, like, this is what I'm gonna need you to do. And so that scene, you know, I, I, I imagine speaking to my son. Some of, some of what I do is also imagination. Mm -hmm. What would that be like? I have an eight-year-old. What would that be like? And I put myself there, you know? And if I'm not moved emotionally, then there's more work still to be done. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. How does substitution work to the point where it's actually useful to you? And when you say like your your mother who is so so close in, in terms of um, you know there must be a lot of other things wrapped up in there when you when you're using yeah. your mother access to a lot of other emotions there. Yeah. Can you just talk a little bit about that? Yeah. Well, I mentioned the sort of a power struggle that we have at times. I give an example. I remember I remember when the first time I was going to go see my father in Sierra Leone and she was really adamant, don't do that. You don't want to go see him. And, you know, there's a real power struggle there because I love her. And the little boy in me is like, I want to listen to my mom. I don't want to make my mom mad. Mm -hmm. She had to raise three kids on her own. I don't want to make her mad. But then the man in me is like, I got to go make amends with my father. Mm -hmm. So then there's the obstacle there of not wanting to disappoint her. Mm -hmm. But then there's the objective of me wanting to go and make amends. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So when you have a substitution, it can inform your performance in giving you two things all at once. The objective, objective of uh, this little boy wants to go see his daddy. Mm -hmm. I miss my dad. I got to go make amends. And the little boy that's like, but I don't want to have my mom mad at me. Energy and that juxtaposed, yeah. yes, yeah. and that juxtaposed energy working inside you is what gives conflict because there's no drama without conflict. Mm -hmm. And it's not going to be fun to watch and see. To watch a character struggle with, do I go? Do I not? I want to see my dad. Mm -hmm. I don't want my mom to feel lonely and, and think I don't love her. Mm -hmm. That back and forth culminating inside of you makes, I mean, I'm even feeling a lot right now mm -hmm. as I'm speaking. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, it gives you a lot to play with. Yeah. And it's really just that kind of like, it's just energy work, isn't it? Acting. Mm -hmm. it yes. Is, it's just manipulation of energy. And then, of course, there's energies on the set, all these sets that you're on there that you have to either set. deal with, use or ignore. You, you know? couldn't have been closer to the truth. I remember I was doing a scene with my with my wife in the room and she's giving me my pain medicine. And I remember just before we were shooting the scene, I had to go to an emotional place, you know, emotional prep, moment before. And there's a brother who was a camera operator and he was in the corner and he was like on his phone watching some video and it was kind of loud. Wow. And I had to tell him, I was like, you know, hey, I said, please, could you just turn that off just until I'm done with this take? And he did. You know, you have to kind of be your own advocate on set. Yeah. You know, shout out to my good friend, Charmaine Bingwa, who kind of gave me that mm -hmm. little little mm -hmm. pointer. You got to be your own advocate. And also at the same time, you want to show a level of humility, kindness, and empathy to others on set. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're the actor. Yeah, the camera's on you. But you want to make sure that people know and feel their value as well. Mm -hmm. Because they're going to give you an energy where you feel like they want you to do well. Mm -hmm. Or they'll give you whatever it is you need to make sure the environment is conducive with giving the right sort of performance. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So that's one thing that I've learned from being on set. I did the Laramie Project, a play mm -hmm. about Matthew Shepard. And I remember being on stage and I remember I, the cast was a small cast, but each cast member had maybe four or five roles that we played mm. and there are varied roles but i just remember being on stage and hearing the audience just sniffling I remember going wow this is cool this is this is this is major i'm moving people mm -hmm. um and you're a lot bigger on stage you project now when you go to film you you bring that down same intensity same intensity, 
more poignant. Mm -hmm. Well, mm -hmm. that right there seems like that's that's hard because it's it's hard to keep the intensity that you that you may have wrapped up in the bigness mm -hmm. and and been able to push that out mm -hmm. to the back of the theater and you're saying keep that and how the hell do you do that <laughs> it's almost like you keep it you bottle it mm -hmm. and you almost have the tiniest straw that's just letting it out it's just it's just fuming out mm -hmm. it's there you know yeah it's bubbling yeah. it's it's and we could see it coming out of your eyes all in the eyes right <laughs> all in the eyes all in the eyes yeah how much of this is is just a natural ability though really do you do you know <laughs> i feel like i feel like some of it is however i feel like if you depend solely on your natural ability mm. and you don't have the craft you don't have the structure yeah you need you, you you need some some semblance of structure or organization otherwise how do you know you've got one two three if you don't have one two three how do you know what step needs adjustment mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You, i i feel like you wouldn't really you wouldn't really know yeah which yeah. step yeah needs the adjustment yeah, that's a good point. I, natural ability i feel like i had in the very beginning in fact i know i had I had no classical training when I started the theater program in college. Mm -hmm. None. I did a monologue when I auditioned for the Laramie Project. And that monologue, my character is, had AIDS. I mean, I'm 18 years old. I don't know much about that or yeah. I don't know much about, you know, my character was married at the time and he had a, he had a, he had a gay lover mm -hmm. and he was sick. And his mother was saying, pray 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 and he's saying to his mom i've been praying i've been praying i'm laying in here in my own piss and poop and i'm sick and i'm dying i don't see god anywhere mm. and that was the monologue i did mm. and i swear to you i had like an out-of-body experience doing that monologue mm. and it was just me going over the material over and over and over and over and over and just personalizing the fact that i do have a mother the fact that i do have a mother who's very prayerful the fact that I do have a mother who does ring that in my ear that you should pray and pray and pray and pray and pray. Mm -hmm. And it was me in college pulling kids from my dorm room into my dorm room saying, hey, sit down, I want to do a monologue for you. <laughs> yeah. Right? Yeah. Until I was so off book and so in the moment that when I did the monologue, those teachers and those professors at the university saw something in me and they said, you know what? As a freshman, you're going to do this play with seniors and juniors. Mm -hmm. And that's what it was. I was the only freshman in that play. Mm-hmm. And that's when I knew, I was like, oh yeah. Mm. Oh, there's a lot bottled up inside of this body. There's a lot of life experience, you know. The different things I've went through, the, and it was all in there. Mm. It just needed a way out. Mm -hmm. You know, growing up, man, I got in so much trouble. I so many fist fights and running with the wrong crowd, you know, running with gang bangers and all this, right? Mm -hmm. they didn't even know I was gonna go to college, but then finally made my way to college, university, and found this. So, yes, the natural talent was there. I'm just grateful that I was able to follow through by moving to LA, by training with some of the best teachers mm -hmm. in Los Angeles, and hopefully even New York whenever I make my time out here, you know? Mm -hmm. When you realized for that Laramie Project mm -hmm. that this took hard work did you think, all right, it's going to take this amount of work every time to reach um, something that I feel proud about? It's not about just being good enough to get the role or anything. It's about the amount of work you want to put into this to feel, feel good for yourself, right? It really is. The more, like with anything, the more you put in, the more you get out. You know, the more you put in, the more you get out. And I don't shy away from the work. I'm all about the work. You know, we talked earlier about how friends of mine see the work and think, how do you, how do you, because failure is just not an option. I wouldn't just be failing myself. 
if I failed. Mm -hmm. There'd be a lot of people I'd be failing. Mm -hmm. So it's just not an option. You know, that's why, like I said, the work ethic. These actors that people see that are A-listers, nothing, nothing bothers me more than when people kind of badmouth actors, you know? Mm -hmm. They have no idea the amount of reading, the amount of studying. And I know some will make it seem as if there's not a whole lot of that that goes on. But I'm telling you firsthand, <laughs> to make it work, mm -hmm. to make it look easy, you have to put in that work and that time and that effort. Mm -hmm. There's no other way. There's no wing in it in this business. There's, there's just, there's just not. You know, the way you have to show up to set prepared, knowing your lines front and back, like you know your social security number, or your address, or your cell phone number. That's pretty much how you have to know it. Mm -hmm. I had my Meisner teacher tell me, you know, uh, Don Bloomfield. Shout out to Don. He was like, you know, you can't act. You can't act. You act from your heart space and your gut. He says, but you can't be here and run upstairs to grab your line in here mm -hmm. in your brain and then run back. Mm -hmm. You've lost the audience already. Interesting. You've yeah. lost the audience, man. Everything's got to, you got to shoot straight from the hip, straight from the gut, straight from the heart. And you got to know those lines front and back in order to do that. I'm talking to you right now, not worried about what I'm going to say. Yeah. Because the lines are in my gut. Right. And I'm speaking to you from the heart. So mm -hmm. I'm not really going up to my brain concerned because the intention is there. The intention is all you focus on when you're doing your scene at that yeah. point. How you, what you want to, the message you want to send. That's all you're concerned with at that point. You know, I used to sit and edit with a guy named Jerry Sackman. Jerry used to edit the Star Wars films in the 80s. Mm. And when I first moved to LA, I used to sit with him. I used to pay something like, I think it was 50 bucks an hour. Mm -hmm. And I'd sit with him and he'd edit, my, he'd edit my demo reels and I'd sit and I'd learn and I'd watch his keystrokes. And I thought to myself, I need to learn how to edit. This is, this is costing me a lot. <laughs> it's pricey, you yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. So, you know, luckily I learned how to edit, but, um, What's the what's the secret of the actual on camera stuff? Like, how do you create life in that in that camera? Yeah, a little, little round light on your face. Yeah, yeah. You know, you just it's a lot of it's the inner work. Who you're talking to, what you want, what's your objective, um, and then once you've actually, you know, Ivana's twelfth step is you throw it all away mm -hmm. once you. Just believe it's there. Believe it's it's in you. I remember when I auditioned for Manadrome, man. That was must, that must have been the third audition of the day, and I was just like, "Look, I'm gonna have a good time." That's with every audition, right? Mm -hmm. One of my acting teachers, Franz Turner, told me, "Salu, impress yourself. If you can impress yourself, then you've done you've done the piece justice." Mm -hmm. And if I can look at my tape on playback and, and laugh or say, "This is a crazy character," or you know, if, if, if I'm entertained, because you're going to be your biggest critic. So yeah. if I'm entertained by a tape and I go, oh, this is hilarious, yeah. or this part right here, or at certain moments, if I'm watching it uh, with my reader and my reader laughs and I laugh, yeah, that's when I go, okay, yeah, I can live with this tape. Yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. and it's the same thing with Manager. I took a risk. You know, they say things like, oh, don't play music in your auditions or don't don't smoke or don't do this i i break all the rules i do whatever i feel like my character is gonna i do whatever i want to do to make sure that i give you a fully fleshed out character mm -hmm. you know i give you what whatever i need to do to make sure that you're watching a real person mm -hmm. you know then that's what i do i have rarely seen a character in a scene in a movie that's more pivotal than your scene, big scene, in mm -hmm. Manadrome. I mean, when you think about that scene and what that does to the entire movie, right? Right? Mm -hmm. And to Jesse Eisenberg's character and what it does to our to the audience. You ha and then what you have to do in that scene, never mind just the intimacy of that scene. Right. I'm talking about even after that, mm -hmm. what happens mm -hmm. right after that. And for it to be happening in such a short period of time, was that one day, that, that scene? That was one day, yeah. So you're, <laughs> the whole movie, if that don't work, man, the whole movie kind of doesn't work. It doesn't work. Right? Yeah.
Now, Jesse's been on the show. I love that guy. Yeah, he's He's awesome. (laughs) Great guy. And we have to give him a little props right now for what he's been doing. He's been doing a lot of small movies that people haven't talked about, but they're all good. Really I'm talking about movies that nobody knows about, like The Hummingbird Effect, which I love. Mm. Like The Art of Self-Defense, which had a little bit of a of a of a following then there's one he did with poots called i don't even know what it's called but it's amazing right. it's like this futuristic thing where they're nobody ignored movie well i don't know what it's called damn it i have to give him props and then nobody cares about it and he moves on he was even marcel marceau in a movie and nobody cared about it giving props to jesse <laughs> for a second Listen, a big shout out to jesse i i when i say i love and adore a co-star he's one that i truly love and adore you know the entire cast adrian brody i got to sit down with him as well at dinner in germany and just pick his brain and he's very gracious with his knowledge Mm -hmm. and expertise and i i value and appreciate that so very much you know it's a scene and 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 a material and context that i'm not familiar with i'm just not yeah i'm not familiar with the culture i'm not familiar with uh and that with any of it and so i had to do a lot of research a lot of digging putting myself in environments and venues that i'm not used to Mm -hmm. um calling on friends of mine who are in the community Mm -hmm. to come over for dinner and sit down with me at a table and break things down (laughs) (laughs) because yeah there's just a lot i just don't know yeah you know and there's a lot of that that went on you know, and on the day we just, we went for it, you know, and Amit, even in the breakdown, it says that he's a, it's a pivotal role. He is the catalyst. Yeah. Because the trajectory of uh, Jesse Eisenberg's character's life, it changes once he meets Amit. Yeah. You know, and unlocks something in him because he's struggling and battling with his identity, his sexual identity. Yeah. And he doesn't know what to do or where to go. You know, then he meets yeah. my character who who helps, I guess, unlock what it is that yeah. he's been yeah. keeping secret. Right. You know. Right. And uh, it's such an intense scene. It's very dark and it's very heavy and it's very sultry. And then it's got a lot of humor in it, too. And yeah. I just right there in the end. Yeah. And I have to give John Trango, the director, some credit as well, because you know, they're his words that I was able to bring to life. Mm-hmm. You know, him and I were able to cook up together. And you were so alive in this in this movie, man. You, you know, it's one of those performances that I would I would understand if you don't get proper recognition, because it's just sometimes there's people that we don't even consider them giving a performance because they're alive as people and we just it just goes it it just functions like we're watching people Mm -hmm. and it doesn't register as a performance and that's the highest compliment i can give thank you and especially when it's a character in a in a in a scene like this in a movie like this a supporting character where you're doing the ultimate supporting because you're not just supporting the main character you're supporting the movie the the story true support because this needed to be done for the movie to to work exactly (laughs) so you are the support of it i want to just uh lift you up here for that because this is what we want we uh so often we get uh stuff that barely reaches a a place of satisfaction and then there's stuff like this wow i really mean that man because i'm talking about all the all the pressure that kind of is on this scene working Mm -hmm. how do you how do you deal with that kind of pressure on a like you're saying you're coming to set with having a lot of respect for these people Mm -hmm. and you have to deliver now the scene you're the delivery person in yeah. this scene how do you deal with that pressure <laughs> i am the delivery person <laughs> in more ways than one yeah. oh man you know i 
I just have to trust the work. At the end of the day, it's all about the work. All egos aside, it's not about me. It's all about the work. And um, if I need something, asking for it, you know, mm. whether it's just checking in with John and saying, what do you, what, what do you think about that? So do, you, do we go again? You know, because he's, and I, I, I don't visit Video Village. There is no, oh, let me see playback. Mm -hmm. I, if they ever did playback, I was never one to go and want to see, you know, because mm -hmm. um, I never wanted to get into my head about what was happening. But I just try to listen to the notes, any notes that John would give. Hey, okay, we're going to do it again. There's, try it. There's this, okay, I'll, okay, okay. And I give myself a minute and go, okay, how can I, all right, maybe at this part. Uh, yeah. okay yeah. make my adjustments mm -hmm. and then go for it again we only did that scene maybe four takes because jesse's mm -hmm. hilarious and very charming and by the fourth take he turned to john looked at me and just got you know you know jesse talks he's very fast paced <laughs> uh, totally, we're, we're done right we're, we're, done, we're, done, we're done we're done yeah i mean what, there's no need to go again is there is there a need to go and he was just hilarious and yeah. you know because of uh, the context of the scene, we we also worked with a, an intimacy coordinator, oh, yeah. which was really nice, uh, just to kind of figure out the dance of yeah. what exactly is going to be going on in the scene. You know, and I love that I got this challenge as my first really big breakout Hollywood role. Yeah, it sh it shows, it tells any casting director, any writer producer. Any other actor that's watching this, like this guy is taking big swings. He'll, he'll go all the way. Yeah. He'll go all the way. Cause who wants to act half? Yeah. Who wants to give a half performance? No, let's go all the way. If we're going to go all the way, let's, let's do it. I remember and I'm only using this example because I know how much love and admiration and respect I have for my teacher. I remember when I first started training with Ivana about a couple of years ago, a few of the notes she'd given me were so direct and no fluff whatsoever, just direct. And I was taken aback. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like, whoa. But then once I set aside my ego completely and entirely, that's when I was able to say, okay, this woman has a point, maybe, mm. you know, maybe she's right. Maybe I am, as, as she put it once in one specific note, you're scared of your anger. Mm. Maybe I am. And, and why is that? You know, you can either take a hard truth or you can get it from somebody, a teacher or someone who beats around the bush and eventually tells you what it is you need to hear or tells you in a, in a gentle way. But I'm just at the point in my career where just give it to me straight, give it to me hard, and then uh, let me adjust. Let me adjust. And, I, and look, I'm big on journaling. I know we hadn't talked much. I mentioned books earlier, but, you know, the books I read, I'm, I'm big on journaling. You know, Dr. Joe Dispenza, Becoming Supernatural, one of my favorite books. Mm -hmm. And I journal and I reflect. And I sat and I took that note Ivana gave me and I said, oh, she's right. I would be scared of my anger because my anger's gotten me in trouble in the past. Mm. So to suppress my anger means I can eliminate that likelihood of getting in trouble because I'm upset and I do something irrational. Mm. But she's now pointed it out to me that, hey, in class, I need, I need that from you. Mm. And it's okay to exercise that here in class. Mm. And that's what she's trying to come. That's, so it's my job to unpack it. It's her job to give me the suitcase, mm -hmm. but it's my job to unpack it and say, okay, what does this mean? <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. My job. Yeah. It's not her job. Yeah. She's going to give it you straight. So. When the clothes are everywhere though. Mm -hmm. And you really face that. Yeah. That's got to be a hard process then of trying to just maybe fold them i don't know keep the analogy going or here putting like the, the putting the outfits together <laughs> there you go put the belt with these slacks and this shirt <laughs> right and it'll, these shoes it'll work that'll work you put it together 
You know, you put it, you pick up the pieces, you put it, you put it together and you hopefully come back next week. And, and here's the thing too, man. I have a text message from Ivana. She texts me. I did a scene once in class and she doesn't do this often. But you know, when somebody gives you a lot of grief and they give it to you straight and the one time they reach out and say, Hey, you did a knockout job tonight. We're at the bar right now where everyone's talking about your work. Mm. Or when you finish a scene and your classmates come up to you and they hug you and they're like, dude, mm -hmm. man, that was phenomenal. And you know, you're on the right path, mm -hmm. you know, but you got it like as, as, uh, it was fences as, the character in Fences says, you got to take the crookeds with the straights, you know? Mm -hmm. You'll have times where you go to class and you do great work and you have times where you go to class, at least for me, and I'm just kicking myself. I'm like, ah. Oh. But more often, it has a lot less to do with talent and a lot more to do with, did I put in enough hours? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Did I have, an, did I have an, a, enough inner objects? Did I have enough inner monologue? Did I have enough beats and actions? Did I have enough obstacles? And if I didn't, then I didn't. Mm -hmm. And I, I, didn't, I didn't put out the scene that I would have wanted to put out. Now, when I do, <sighs> there's just, it's undeniable. Mm -hmm. And that's why I love training with her. And that's why I love training in general. You want to be undeniable. And that's one thing I got from Gina. Gina told me she was at the airport when she saw my tape and screamed. Wow. And knew we found Amit. We found the right character for this role. She forwarded it to John, didn't give him any, oh, I found him, I found him. She just said, watch it. His response was the same. I remember the first Zoom I had with Jesse Eisenberg and he said, look, full disclosure, like they showed me the tape and you were phenomenal, scary and 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 dangerous and, and sexy and all these things. And I thought, great, awesome. And that's what you wanna do with every tape, you know? Yeah, it's hard, it's not easy, but and there'll be roles that are a lot, some some roles will resonate with you more and some just, you gotta dig a little deeper, you know. I wrote two words down mm -hmm. before we started taping. You said those two words. Right, <laughs> right. And that was a little weird. That was very serendipitous actually. Yeah. Curiosity and empathy. Those two things I think are the two things that an, as, that an actor needs. You got to stay curious. So it's easy to get closed off, especially with hurts in life. You know, we build up walls. Just yesterday, I got a group of actors to get together, my New York actor friends, and we had a beautiful brunch. Can't stay closed off. This is a communal thing that we do, community. No one can go alone. It takes a village to raise a great actor. Mm -hmm. You know, and being empathetic, when you sit down and listen and talk with friends or sit down and listen and talk with co-stars, and you guys can relate and get on that level. It's an exercise in craft, yeah. empathy. You know, if someone's telling you something that's very touching and you're just cold about it. Yeah. You don't care about mankind or humanity or you just can't find, you don't find a way to relate. Gotta find a way to relate. That's empathy. Yeah. Actors need that. Salusa say, I'm genuinely excited about what you have to offer us the door is always open here thank you so much thank you thank you for having me back to one is a production of filmmaker magazine which is a publication of the gotham formerly ifp listen to back episodes of this podcast at filmmakermagazine.com or wherever you get your podcasts